Note to listeners, this episode was recorded in June 2020. The coronavirus, COVID-19, was recognised as a pandemic by the World Health Organisation on 11th of March 2020. In this episode, I speak to Jason Cutter about selling with authentic persuasion. We discuss the importance of intent in sales and the need to share your own personal story. Jason explains the difference between those who are authentic manipulators and those that use authentic persuasion. He warns us away from the order takers who try to sell you something, even if it's not what you really need. Jason's belief is that marketing done right is leadership. This is an interesting conversation around sales, ethics and persuasion. Listen up to the rest of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast, on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today, our guest is Jason Cutter. Hi, Jason. Hi, how are you? I'm really cool. And you? Hi, I'm great. Excellent, excellent. Before we kick off, tell us about you. Well, I grew up in the Bay Area in California. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because now what I do is I help companies and salespeople improve their effectiveness. But I grew up in a very non sales household. My mom was a banker and a finance manager before she retired. My dad was an engineer and project manager before he retired. And uh, then I went to school for marine biology. I have a degree wow. in that and I focused on sharks. Uh, and then between that and now, I've done so many different things on a very windy path. I think that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. So you know how to avoid the sharks in sails then? Uh, you know what? I think it might be easier in the water to avoid those <laughs> sharks. Uh, you know, for most people, you just stay out of the water. It's, it, it's, uh, it's harder for sure, the uh, sharks in sails. Yeah, I'm really curious about our conversation today because we're going to talk about selling with an authentic persuasion, which I'm really curious to know more about. So... What can you tell me about it? Yeah, it's really the framework that I came to use for myself and then with hundreds of salespeople I've helped across various organizations and, and even in various countries where it's more of being authentic, being true to you, using self-awareness and your strengths and being who you are instead of trying to pretend to be someone else. There's a lot of times when someone is in a sales role or a selling role, whether they're in a call center or working at a store or they're a coach or a consultant and they know that they have to sell somebody on their services to hire them so that they can then do what they like to do more. Uh, you know, there's this feeling that you've got to pretend to be something else, to, you know, what we see in the movies and TV and what we think about when it comes to sales. And I firmly believe the opposite, which is, you know, if you use the power of being who you are and being authentic to your past, your experiences, your talents, your skills, your abilities, and then you marry that with persuasion. So using persuasion instead of manipulation to proactively move the right people forward in the conversations and towards some kind of transaction towards the sale, then you have this, you know, wonderful effect where you're creating very happy clients that you're solving their problems or helping them achieve a goal and also getting rewarded for it. That sounds good. So do you see persuasion and influence to be the same thing or is there any is there a difference? 
No, I, I think it's the same. I mean, it really de- depends on where you're using it and um, really the intent. For me, you know, when it comes to manipulation, the intent is to get you to do something for my benefit, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then for persuasion, it's not, it can be kind of vague when you look at the definition. Persuasion is kind of the same thing, but the way I use it is positive persuasion, which is I'm going to get you to do something that will benefit you based on what I know about what you want and what you're trying to solve or accomplish. And then also get something for myself as well if I'm doing the right thing. Influence, for me, it's it feels like persuasion, which is okay. And we think of influencers now because that's now the word on social media and online, which is I'm going to influence you to buy this thing or take this action. And then, of course, I'm getting rewarded. For me, I see influence as more of a blind shotgun. Hey, you know, here's this thing and I think it's amazing and everyone should use it versus persuasion, which is you want X, I have X. Now let's, you know, finish this transaction. Mm, That's really curious, actually, because I would see influence as you discuss persuasion. But then I guess (laughs) I don't, I see influence so for me, influence and real leadership is the same thing. So I am not seeing it in the sales perspective. So I can see what you're saying, um, how influence can be seen as almost, in a sales way, a softer version of manipulation. I can see that. Um, but when I'm thinking about influence, I'm thinking about it in terms of really good leadership. So pretty much how you're describing persuasion. So it made me think, oh, I should probably define what I mean when I say influence. So people understand what I'm saying. It shows you how language is really, really important. Exactly. And I, and I think that's part of it. When I was working on the book that I'm writing, you know, the first thing that uh, my mentor said to me is, well, what is, what's your definition of authenticity and what's your definition mm. of persuasion? Like, wh- what does that mean? Because those are words that everyone thinks they know there's different uses, but even that influence versus persuasion kind of conversation, really to me, all that matters is the intent. What yeah. is the intent? Is it my intent to get you to take action, get out of your comfort zone, get past your fear? and do what you need to do to accomplish your goal or to avoid pain? Um, Am I doing it for you and then I know I'm going to get rewarded in the back end or is it all about me? Yeah, and what made me think when you were saying that was that with manipulation, the person doesn't tell them what their intention is. But if you're influencing or persuading in in your definition, you are actually quite upfront with it. Do you know what I mean? This is what I'd like you to do because X, Y, Z. You're not trying to do it in a sneaky way. You're actually very upfront about it. And for me, and this goes back to something you said a few minutes ago about leadership. For me, I see the role of a salesperson as a leader. Now, I'm not talking sales leader as in manager or mm-hmm. you know vice president of sales or, or business owner. I mean more of like you are the leader of that conversation and of that mm-hmm. transaction um, and wanting to be a leader that's using persuasion, using influence to help lead that person to you know, the finish line, if you will. That makes sense. Oh, I like that. So what's your definition for authentic then? For me, that is being true to who you are Mm -hmm. at the intersection of your talents, your skills, abilities, and experiences um, in ways that, you know, is true for you. And I think really the big key, and this is what I see a lot, and this is what I struggled with a lot myself, was I was ashamed and or embarrassed and or tried to keep a lot of my experiences and my path um, secret. Uh, I didn't want to share it because it didn't feel like it fit the standard blueprint, you know, Mm. the American dream model, which is, you know, go to school, get a degree, get a job, have a career, start a family, do all those things, you know, and go down this nice linear path, which I don't think anybody does anymore, but at (laughs) least that's, that's what we're told. And, you know, and and the time when I grew up, it was, you know, I was going to be the first one in my family to go to college. And, uh, okay, this had set me on a better path than my parents had, where they had to, you know, work very hard to have what they, they have. And um, so for me, authenticity, authenticity is really just bringing everything of who you are and embracing that and then not trying to pretend to be somebody else. But how do you distinguish your viewpoint from people who are being authentically manipulative? So, do you know what I mean? So, like, because I, I like what you were saying, authenticity 
is, is, is something that is overused and it's kind of presented as like this is you know if you're authentic everything just falls together but then there are people who are horrible and I don't really want to meet or buy from their authentic yeah. selves. So how does, you, how does your philosophy sort of distinguish between what you're saying and those other people? Well, and that's really why um, for me and the framework and, and everything that I do, it's not the authentic sales process. It's the authentic persuasion process, right? Oh. So it's marrying those two together to differentiate it from what you're saying, which I totally agree with it. No one's asked <laughs> me that before and brought that up, but it's very true, right? Because you can be authentically manipulative because yeah. that's who you are. That's how you see the world. And that's what you're going after. And that's what you're going to do to people and to yourself. Uh, and I've met those people. I've, I've worked mm. with those people and, and really done my best to go. I don't want to be like that for my sake and for my customers. Uh, that's not the best way to play the game long term, you know, the people who authentically manipulate tend to change jobs a lot, change careers or change, you know, sales companies, um, because right. they're constantly having to find new people or a new thing to sell or, you know, something, something shiny. Well, they get um, so yeah, for me, it's really marrying those things together. It's, it's the authentic and then the persuasion. And in the framework that I focus on, again, it's about the intent and the outcome is for the benefit of you. Um, at first, and then also for me to win, but it's really about your benefit. That makes sense. I must say, all the people I've ever worked with who have ever been clients of mine have all become friends. And I think that's probably because it's, it's I don't know, it's authentic and I'm honestly yep. trying to help and support. And, you know, I've been in situations where people want to buy and they've said, like, yeah, I definitely want to buy X, Y, and Z, and this is what I want, and you can deliver it. And I've said, yeah, I don't think that's right for you, though, because, say, so for example, they, they want a, they've asked me to design a program that will deliver something for their business. And I'll say, yeah, I can do that, but the problem is, until you've done this assessment or, you know, we've reached X point, we don't really know what happens after. So I know you yeah. want me to sell you something so you can buy now, but how about if I just sell you this first piece and then you can honestly take a break at that point and do it yourself because you'll get an action plan or something, or we can then design something that's definitely going to fit once we know what the key problem is. And people do sound really surprised, like, but I'm going to give you X grand. <laughs> but I'll be taking your money and we really, and I can't guarantee I can help you. So I'd rather not take the money. Let me guarantee this part because this bit I know we can do. To, to me, that's the perfect example of how a sales professional would operate and how any professional would operate. I mean, there's a lot of parallels when you're doing sales. And again, so your main job is consulting and mentoring and oh. coaching and leadership right? But there's yeah. the sales aspect, which is to get people to do it. Otherwise, and this is the phrase I use a lot, which is order takers. There's unfortunately a lot of people out there in the world who have a sales role or a sales component, but they're order takers. So they're just waiting for that person with the money in hand who's handing it over um, so that they don't have to actually do the sales part. Because mostly what I've seen is they're either not confident or they're afraid of manipulating. So they just don't do anything because they mm. don't see the, 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 the middle part. But for me, when somebody's achieved, you know, getting to a sales professional level, it's when they can tell the wrong people no, when they're coming from both abundance and doing the right thing with the right intent. It's, hey, I know you want this. It's not a good fit. I can't help you. Here's what you should do or here's who you should talk to instead. When you do that, um, it's very powerful because it will shock the other person. It will shock your prospect that you don't want to just take their money. Um, but it's you know <laughs> doing the right thing for them. <laughs> I mean, it will. And and it, and if you're if you're really good at it, um, uh, it will leverage into a lot of referrals because it will shock people, right? Like imagine going to a mechanic and the mechanic says, "No, you don't need to get anything done with your car. Go do this instead." Like yeah. you're going to want to send all your friends there because exactly. it's, you, know, yeah. you can trust them, right? There's this there's this weird thing that just happened where they didn't try to just take your money for no good reason. Um, and so you know when you do that, it's referrals. And then also the power is when you tell the wrong people no that aren't a good fit. When you tell the right people yes, there's so much power in it. And mm. it answers that, like, how do you sleep at night thing? It's like, well, yes. I only push the right people forward um, and I tell the wrong people no. Yes, because for me, it's, it comes from a standpoint of ethics. 
you know it's yeah. not ethical to take someone's money if you can't help them it's just it's just the wrong thing to do correct um, even if you might need the money <laughs> yeah it's probably even especially more important that you stick to your ethical viewpoint i guess yeah correct interesting so how did you get into this <laughs> well, like um, it was in sales in general, like most people, I fell into it. I was working at Microsoft at the time. Our jobs got uh, outsourced to uh, over, overseas um, for the first time ever. This was back in 2002. And I needed a job. Family friend said, hey, I got a guy. He's uh, running a mortgage company. You could go work for him. And so then I ended up in the sales in a sales role with really no training, no idea what I was doing, no background in it, which I think is what happens to a lot of people who end up in a sales role and um, had to learn a lot of things the hard way, learn, you know, failed a bunch, some lessons from 2002, I literally still remember and use to this day and teaching other people. And, um, you know, then long journey for 17 years of, of figuring it out and moving around in companies and, and being in leadership roles and, you know, just learning it and observing. Okay. That sounds good. Are you able, were you able right from the beginning to kind of accept that moniker of salesperson or did it make you kind of feel icky and go, I'm not a salesperson? I think it was easy because it was, uh, my title was loan officer, right? So it wasn't even salesperson. <laughs> and um, it was, this is 2002 in the US where, you know, it was a hot housing market. Everyone wanted to buy and refinance. So it really didn't take much selling to convince people. Um, there were still mistakes that I made, but um, it didn't take a lot of sales. It wasn't a lot of arm twisting. People were just begging um, for loans and to buy houses. So um, that wasn't so much. It, it wasn't until later on when I realized what I was doing was sales and then really tried to perfect it. But again, it, I had been raised in an anti-sales household mm. and um, I didn't want to get into sales. I didn't want to deal with people. Then I ended up working in a restaurant and I didn't want to deal with people. And then I worked at Microsoft and then I got into sales uh, and then I realized like, hey, I'm here and what I enjoy doing is helping people and solving problems and helping them get what they want. And then for me, you know, you can label it as sales, uh, but you know, that's what I've embraced. So your driver is to help people get what they want. Yeah, and solve problems and trigger some kind of transformation. So, for example, like I, I've never done it. I've never sold cars. I don't think there's anything wrong with selling cars. Um, I think <laughs> most people should – Somebody's got to sell them. I think most people shouldn't buy new cars. I think most people can't afford them, but they do it yeah. anyway. I know why they they're excited by it. I've been there myself. Um, but you know, for me, whatever I've sold and whatever I've done, it's usually some kind of transformation. It's helping somebody in some way get to a better place or accomplish something. So for me, it's that problem solving and then helping someone you know move forward. So do you think that's the key then that the the willingness or the desire to help someone solve a problem they have and if you're not able to do that you shouldn't do sales well i think what's going to happen is your results and your income is going to reflect it i mean you know like like they say you your income is a reflection of your value that you're providing to other people. And you can either sell a lot of small things to some, to a, a large group of people and, you know, make your revenue and, and show your value that way, right? You solve a small problem. Maybe you're selling, you know, let's say knives and you're solving a small issue, but you can do it a lot or you're solving bigger issues and you get paid even more. But for me, it's, that's what the value is. That's what you're doing. That's what business is about. That's what sales is about is helping someone. And again, it doesn't matter. You could be selling knives for example, and solving people's issues and helping them with their cooking and their time in the kitchen. And that's fantastic. Okay. That makes, that does make a lot of sense. I, I have to admit to a confession. I have just downloaded your ebook. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Do you want to tell the audience about, about that? 
Yeah. So it's called The Power of Authentic Persuasion. And it's really just a journey and stories of some people in my life uh, that I've worked with before or who worked for me and how they use uh, the power of authentic persuasion. Because this kind of discussion is one that happens all the time. Again, there's there's two sides of the spectrum. There's the, there's the kind of shark manipulator, boiler room, kind of like, you know, uh, slit in throats uh, to, you know, get what they want because they don't really care and taking no prisoners. And then there's the other extreme, like I said, which is people who are operating more like order takers. They're afraid of being that manipulator. They don't want to go down that path. They don't want to do anything close to that. They don't want to, they don't want to use the slick closing lines of like, hey, if I can show you how to save $500 by Friday, is this something you'd be interested in, right? Like they don't want to have to use those lines. I know those lines. I, I'm, I'm a student of all things sales, but you know, using those kind of tactics are just, you know, not necessarily for the right outcome. And so people tend to shy away from everything sales related and act as order takers. And again, I think there's this wonderful, effective balance in the middle, which is your who you are, and then you're doing the right thing for that other person and you're moving them forward. Yeah. Yeah, because that's really interesting because that reminded me of something that happened to me where we was working with, a local government client, although they weren't a client at at that time. And we were in that stage of trying to see whether we would work together. They said that they had a problem and said we could resolve it. No, we got to this position. We're like, yes, you're the supplier we're going for. We want you to start X, Y, Z, but we really want you to take out this particular part of the program. And it was one of our key differentiators from us and you know, other people. And I really thought really long and hard because they were absolutely, you're not going to have this in the program, but we'll pay you for everything else. Um, And I said to them, okay, let me think about that and come back to you. So I came back to them the next day and I said, look, I can't take it out because based on what it is that you say you want to achieve, you need this in the program. I said, I can play with other things, but this needs to stay. And I said, we don't want you. And I said, okay, that's fine. I could probably recommend you to work with somebody else, but I just can't work with you. And then there was this pause, and I said, why do you care so much about this bit? And so then I explained, this is why I think you need it, because it's integral for the whole thing, and it hangs together like this, and it serves this solution. They were like, I'm really glad you fought for it, because, yes, you know, we need that, and let's just go ahead. So, so for them, it wasn't about price. It wasn't like no. you, know, you, you cost you more. It's like we can't because it's a bit, it's a propriety piece. So therefore, you can't see it anywhere else. So it's like we're not sure. Being like government, we want to take the risk on this particular part of the program because we don't know. You know, we don't know anything about this. But once I explained, they were okay. And I think if I had a more transactional mindset, it would have been. Yeah, okay, we'll take it out, but we'll go ahead with the rest of it. Oh, and I I think that's a huge lesson for anyone listening, Um, even more than somebody might realize, is when I hear that story, that's the epitome of what it's like to be both a sales professional and to be a professional, and then also to be a leader using that authentic persuasion piece. Because here's what I know that I know, is that if you had gone transactional with that, and you had signed them up, and then you'd taken their money and done the sessions and and whatever it was that you were going to do without that other piece, they would not have been happy. Yes, you would have checked the boxes for what they said they wanted, but they wouldn't have been happy because they wouldn't have gotten any real results out of it because it was missing the secret sauce. And what I know is that if you have something that you're selling and it works a certain way or you have certain rules or parameters set up like agreements or contracts or, or deposits or you know whatever that might be, when somebody doesn't do it and you bend to get the deal done and, and you know, accommodate their demands, if you will, the problem is they usually become a terrible client, right? They, yeah. they then want to make other demands or they're still not happy because they're trying to get you to play by their rules instead of you helping them within your framework. And um, yeah, whenever you do that, it doesn't work. So that's, that's an amazing story. That's actually <laughs> super powerful for, for people to, 
you know, utilize and kind of model after, which is, you know, you know, the service you're providing, you know, the value, you know what it will do. And again, you know, that it's either going to be great for someone or it's not going to be a good fit. And then also that abundant side. Yeah. And it wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't like, well, no. now you've got to have it because we really want you to do that work. <laughs> really yeah. want to do it. And it had taken months to get that point as well. And it's like, oh, you're going to be throwing away months and months of work. But it was like, I wouldn't be happy because I wouldn't be able to deliver what I know I can deliver. It's not going to work out. So exactly. I did a podcast probably a couple of years ago with somebody who came on and they told the they were and their argument was marketing is strategic marketing is the same as strategic leadership. Marketing and leadership is the same thing, but from a different perspective. So with your persuasive sales, do you think that's similar? I I think it's all the same. In fact, um, you know, for me, several times in my career, I have led sales, marketing, and sometimes operations. Mm. For me, I see the customer journey, like the person who's starting out as a, as a prospective lead all the way to the customer as one journey. It starts, marketing starts the conversation, whether it's a, a blog article or a podcast mm. that gets somebody thinking about it, or it's a banner ad, or it's an email, whatever it is, right? Whatever is starting that conversation between me, the company, Company or the individual salesperson and you, the prospective lead, that conversation should then be continued when they interact with me, the salesperson, right? Like I'm just continuing that conversation. The problem in a lot of organizations is they marketing versus sales, right? Sales mm. says, give us better leads. Marketing says, close the leads. Uh, they're, they're good, right? And so it's kind of this battle and it, it's that way in most organizations instead of it being a continuation. And I, I, I agree. I mean, I think marketing when done right is leadership because it's also attracting the right people and then wanting to lead them down this path towards their goals or, you know, avoiding pain, whatever that might be. And so, yeah, it's, it's leading them in the same way as then as a salesperson, right? Like even just a person sitting in a cubicle on a phone, it's your job to lead that prospect and continue that conversation that marketing started. Yeah, that's true. And opt out of that journey if it's not the, if it's not the right one for the customer, because that's going to be a right. better outcome than your sales target. And that's what marketing should do as well. Marketing should mm-hmm. tell the right people what it is that they do and how they can help them, right? In, in alignment with their vision, their mission, their core values. And it should tell the wrong people as early as possible that it's not a good fit for you, right? Even before yeah. the sales process. Because uh, it was really interesting. I remember years ago when I, when I was a young thing, uh, I was like, it was years ago. <laughs> I remember working for this uh, this company where they had this huge marketing campaign for a product, and I remember doing like the like the professional degree in that industry, and I remember watching the ads on television, going, "Hey, we can't offer that because that's not legal." Because <laughs> it's like yeah. it was just like, huh? And, the, and it was so bizarre because. The marketing had a fantastic idea and said, right, we're going to market this product, which was a fantastic product. Everybody rang up and then people on the phones were like, we can't offer you this. <laughs> right. We're not allowed to. You know? And it was that kind of, how did nobody check before you spent thousands on a television campaign that it wasn't legal? It wasn't like it was a bad thing. It was just because of the industry it had very peculiar laws. Sure. You know, so you just couldn't sell it. You couldn't sell this. In this you know, there was a reason no one else was selling it because you're not allowed to. <laughs> but it was interesting that nobody in marketing had actually bothered to find out whether it's possible. Somebody must have sat there and gone, this is a great product. Let's just put this thing together. Well, and sometimes I've seen it where the leadership at the very top is then pushing marketing to, you know, live up to some kind of metric, some KPI, some, some, you know, results or response. And either they're telling them, hey, let's try this and just do whatever you need to to generate sales or marketing is disconnected and doesn't understand what is sold and being sold and what is allowed to be sold. I mean, I've also seen it where, you know, people 
go from marketing into the conversation with the salesperson and they're, you know, the conversation is totally different, right? They're promising, you know, red apples and the person gets on the phone and is trying to be sold, you know, oranges Mm -hmm. and it doesn't fit and the person's confused because they don't understand it. And that's where those departments, in my opinion, to be successful, always have to be married at the hip. So that is that, I think it just made me think what you were saying earlier, is that kind of, what's your intention? Because it reminds me, you know, there's somebody who else is a very persuasive seller in the sense that, I don't know if you have it in the States, we have, uh, we have, we have a bit, our consumer laws are a bit different, so that if somebody comes to your property to sell you something, so you've invited them in, like a salesperson, then you're right to um, decline the contract I think you have like hours or something, but if they phone up, um, then you've got longer. I can't remember which way around it is, but there's a difference between whether you go to them or they come to you, whether you can get like a seven days cancellation notice mm-hmm. or something. And this guy came round to do a fitted wardrobe and he was in the house for like forever. And in the end, it's like, look, and then he, then he had those kind of, you know, those traditional kind of sales things where they say, Oh, let me just pop to my car and it comes back. Oh, I can give you a 50% discount right. if you sign up today. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you're like, I know I'm young, but I'm not stupid. Anyway, so right. in the end, I sort of said, look, you need to go home. And, I'm not sure and he actually said, but 80 or 90% of my customers, if they don't buy today, they're never going to buy. Right. And it was like, well, there you go. <laughs> There's a really good reason for you to go now. You know, it, yeah. and it, he was just staying in the house and refusing to leave to the point I said, do I have to call the police for you to go home? Wow. You know what I mean? Because it was just like, and that's what he said, but if I go now and you don't sign up, you're not going to sign up. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know? And I, I don't know if you ever get those kind of salespeople or even if yeah. it was just I, like, I've, I'm I've... not leaving the house until you sign up. And it's like, well, I'll have to call the police then. And I, and I have, and that's, that's the unfortunate side with a lot of people who get into sales is they get desperate. They need to yeah. close deals. They need to make money. Um, or there's this pressure. If you don't sell, sell like they're not going to meet their quota and maybe they're going to get fired. Right. So trying it's not to, always yeah, trying, to guilt, making, trying to guilt you into it. Cause that's what they were saying. It's like, well, it's not yeah. my fault. Yep. And so what happens is this vicious loop, right? Because they're desperate, they push hard because they're pushing hard. They're not going to close as many deals versus just having a conversation and relaxing and using something like authentic persuasion instead of trying to force it. Right. And understanding that there's some people you're just not going to sell to, right. You're not going to close a hundred percent, but when it's a good fit, then it should be a good fit. And those are the ones that you should get. I think he had taught, he talked himself out of the sale because the reason, you know, the reason we worked in there was because we liked what they had and we had the money to buy it. But he wouldn't tell us that, you know, because they had to come and measure and everything. It wouldn't actually tell us how much it was because he just kept wanting to upsell, 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 even though he'd, he'd like had a closed sale. And then he just tra- kept trying to upsell. And to the point, it's like, now you're, now you just won't leave my house and I'm hungry and I want to cook dinner tonight, you know? <laughs> yeah. What? And- and, you know, it's it's like we know about animals sensing fear, right? Like a dog can sense when somebody doesn't like dogs and they act totally different. Prospects, you in your house, when that person came, you could sense the, either the fear or the lack of confidence, you know, when, when somebody just won't answer the question, right? Like, like I use this example all the time. If you go to here in the States, the the DMV or any kind of government office Mm. and you ask them, Hey, what do I have to do? Okay. Here's the paperwork. How much is it going to cost? Okay. It's going to be $200. Okay. What about this here? Like it's just very yes, no transactional. Here's the answers, right? There's no games. The the person at the government office where you're, you have to pay a, a, a fee for something isn't going to beat around the bush and then not tell you and then maybe try to upsell. You know, they just tell you, right? And so if you're in sales and you're confident and you're helping people, you should have that same attitude, which is like, here's the fee. Here's what I do. Here are the options, right? Um, yeah. When it's appropriate in the conversation. So I'm looking at your ebook because I, I downloaded it, like I said, and it says the power of authentic persuasion, becoming a self superstar. So I will definitely be reading it, but give me a sneak peek. How do I become a self superstar? 
it's it, it's doing what you're already doing. You're already there. I already know it. Um, you know, it, it's using the stuff we talked about. It's that authentic persuasion formula in embracing leadership as a salesperson that you want to help other people get what they want. Wow. That's quite powerful, actually. I think people would be less frightened of sales if they just saw it as helping somebody else. Exactly. Excellent. It's probably a good place to stop there. But before I do, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Because if I, if there is, here's your chance now to tell me. <laughs> no, you did a great job. We took a, a long journey throughout all this. I mean, you know, I think one of the biggest keys too, and I, I talk about this a lot, but it's the self-awareness piece. Mm. You know, being being who I am now and the journey that I took through everything. Again, like I said, I beat myself up for the longest time. It wasn't until later on, like late 30s, when I realized, wait, everything I'd been through has made me who I am and given me experiences and the positives and the negatives, you know, the ups and the downs. And, um, you know, it's all made me who I am. But it's that self-awareness piece that I always support everyone in exploring and understanding. It's what do you like doing? Where can you provide the most value? What do you enjoy doing? Um, you know, what are your strengths? And then what are your weaknesses? And, and go more on your strengths than trying to change who you are, just be more, you know, mindful and self-aware. Brilliant. I can definitely get behind that. So would you come back again if we found another subject? Yeah, for sure. There's so much stuff we can talk about. I have as so so many different things we can talk. You want to talk about sharks, you want to talk about uh, different things I've done, uh, different topics. I mean, anything mindset related, marketing, leadership, it's all it's all fun. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Jason as much as I enjoyed having it. At the Maverick Paradox, we improve your impact and influence by enabling you to effectively strategize, innovate and execute. To find out more, contact us at judith at maverickparadox.com. Thank you. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. Finally, if you would like to work with us or are interested in the Maverick at work, check out maverickparadox.co.uk. Mm-hmm.